safe, healthy communities that current and future generations can not only survive, but thrive. As a Fem Green New Deal Coalition member, I have a lot of reflections. Our coalition, manifested in 2009, has challenged me and forced me to move beyond my comfort zone and critique all that I hold dear. As an academic, I traverse multiple worlds and I speak multiple tongues in the pursuit of what some would call freedom or liberation. This work is often critiqued as work that exists in the ivory tower. However, the work that I do as a community-based and feminist scholar actually shapes a feminist future in the spirit of New Deal policy architects like Frances Perkins and Mary McLeod Bethune. So as we transition from discussions of the Green New Deal to the um, Inflation Reduction Act, I want us to pause and think about what this moment really means. So let's talk about the elections. We're living through reactionary conservatism and a backlash of electoral gains made by the women's rights movement, the civil rights movement, and environmental rights movement. Since the 1960s, we've seen a rise in U.S. conservatives resisting social movement gains and also a reinvigoration of voter suppression and gerrymandering in majority BIPOC voter districts. These are the same folk who vote for feminist climate justice. We nevertheless must use our political education and electoral activism as Fem Green New Deal board members to combat the rise of this reactionary right wing conservatism. We also must challenge threats to reproductive health and abortion rights. We also must remember that this just transition must be a gender just transition. We have to be wary of greenwashing in the renewable sector that is still dominated by white male elites. We mustn't forget critiques of sustainable development, critiques that have been heard since the 1980s. We must rethink what it, multilateralism. When we think about calls or we hear calls for loss and damage, which is very important at COP27 and climate reparations, we mustn't forget US-based EJ communities who are still struggling in sacrifice zones within the borders of the global north. So how do I engage all of these issues in my own work? As the advisory board chair of the High Fund for Climate and Gender Justice, we fund over 100 grantees in the South, a, a region that is um, an emerging clean energy, was home to emerging clean energy opportunities, but yet has experienced low levels of philanthropic funding. We are also building not only people power, but cultural power gender just power to stop the expansion of dirty, dirty energy industries and also increase the power of women, BIPOC, and frontline leaders. Finally, as a program director at the Initiative for Energy Justice, we are ensuring that equity is centered in our discussions of the just transition. We are also ensuring that everyday folk have an understanding of utilities, that everyday folk have an understanding of equitable um, local solar, and also that these tech, and that understanding that these technologies are not gender neutral and that a gender lens is needed in assessment of all renewable energy projects. So in closing, never forget that frontline communities, women, queer folk, youth must be included in decision making when it comes to this new energy democracy and also in the fair distribution of benefits of all energy projects, a particular goal in the US of the Justice 40 initiative. And we mustn't ever forget that our care practices aligned with healing justice are crucial for the sustainability of our political activism. And this will allow us to unapologetically achieve our abolitionist political ends. Thank you. Yes, hi. My name is Jackie Patterson. I'm with the Chisholm Legacy Project, a resource hub for black frontline climate justice leadership. And it's an honor to be here with you all. Um, when I arrived in Egypt, since I've arrived in Egypt a few days ago, every day people, someone will ask me, you know, how's it been for me here? And I always kind of say that I'm 75% here, 75% at home, and 25% here in terms of my attention. And this is the reality of organizing as a black woman in the United States and how consuming it is. We're 
we're holding so much in terms of accountability to our communities, which means we're holding so much in terms of both challenge and also in terms of the promise of, of, of inspirational leadership that, that's modeled by so many. Um, so what's also occupying 70, what, what's holding me in terms of uh, occupying 75% of my time at home is communities like Ironton, Louisiana, where it, there are women there organizing grandmothers, granddaughters, uh, and so forth, who are organizing around the fact that they're a community that has been hit time and time again by hurricanes and disasters. They're a community that is surrounded by industry. They have a coal terminal next to them. They have an oil terminal next to them. And they um, were ravaged by the most recent storms to the extent where their cemeteries were unearthed and they had caskets um, floating through their, their neighborhood. And then afterwards, then came through their neighborhoods the, uh, the folks who are from a railroad that wanted to, to take advantage of the fact that they had been displaced, that they were down, and they said, oh, you know, this is going to happen to you time and time again. We want to buy your land and displace them from the, this historically black community that they had lived in for so long. And so now they're, they're looking at these um, contracts that they're trying to push on them to, to get them to move from where they've, they've lived for their, for their entire lives. So we're working with them to provide legal support. What's also occupying my time is a place like Sand Branch, Texas, which is right out of sight of Dallas, Texas, which is one of the richest um, um, cities in the world. And yet this community, a historically black community, has not had running water since the mid 80s. Um, the mid 1980s, and so the community has been has been fighting to to get water since then. Meanwhile, they not only don't have running water, but they've been declared to be a floodplain, even though they've never had a flood in the history of their of their community. And so that means that the Federal Emergency Management Association has now um, agency has now offered them um, money to move again the displacement of our communities that are historically black communities. And so they're asking them to move, and they're paying them. For, for houses that have been in their families for generations and generations, $350 for their homes and land. And, and this to, to be displaced from the only um, home that their families and their families before them has ever known. But yet, one thing that is keeping me up is the fact that the, the, the folks who are in leadership there, Phyllis um, and um, Tonette Bird, both when black women who are leading this effort in spite of kind of so much that's against them. So that kind of gives me hope and it also makes me want to, to stay up, to continue to, mm -hmm. to work with them and support them. And on Tuesday, what kept me up all night until dawn was the elections and watching the returns from the elections. My heart broke, both broke as I saw um, another black woman, Stacey Abrams, who certainly deserved to be the governor of the state of Georgia. Mm -hmm. Yes, <laughs> and who is displaced by someone who does not have the very principles and practices that we talk about here at heart of what they are um, uh, leading on. But what also woke me up in the morning with joy was the, the winds of people like Mary Black, who's in this for the council person for Raleigh, <laughs> and, um, and Pamela Pugh, who won her, her seat for the Board of Education in Michigan, in a place where she is constantly getting threats, but she, she pushes on, um, and as she uh, fights against people who are trying to, to get critical race theory out of the schools and so forth. So as I focus on what's happening here at COP27 and determine how to mo most use my time most usefully, I think about what will it take to make all of this worthwhile, all of these thousands of people that have come together, all the greenhouse gas emissions that were spent to get people here. And we also know the, the forces, even our own government, pushing back against loss and damage, pushing back against the very types of decisions that we need to see made here. And we know that the principles and practices of the feminist Green New Deal, deal around creating regenerative economies that center systemic feminist alternatives, ensuring democratically controlled and community-led solutions. So we have to embrace the fact that this is not only possible in terms of how we um, transform our economy, but it's actually necessary in order for us to all, as we say, not only just survive, but to actually thrive. So 
We saw how um, I, the other day I actually did a talk with a group of students, and um, and they were and at the end of the talk, which was fairly not so happy um, and positive as it could have been, but the per, the person who was facilitating asked me to leave the students with uh, some hope, and um, and then he said that they just that last that last week they had a speaker there from Pfizer who was the CEO of Pfizer Pharmaceuticals, and they said he, he said that at the end he left the students with hope because he talked about how they had created a vaccine in nine months and I said well you know <laughs> I said yes I could see that in terms of hope in terms of what's possible but what drove them to do that was profit um, and so we know that that is driving too much of the decisions here but what that did tell us in the context of, of, uh, of COVID-19 is what's possible in terms of people coming together around mutual aid when we all decide that we have the will and the love for each other to pull together what is possible in terms of universal basic income and we saw people all getting um, money to be able to go from day to day what was possible in terms of being able to provide energy, be able to provide water without the threats of shutoff for non-payment, not punishing people for the price of poverty. And so in wrapping, I know our sisters here has given me the signals here. Um, so we know that we can, um, we have a planet that's divinely designed and, we, and, and it's um, de designed with regenerative abundance. So we know that we can have water for all in a world that's two thirds water. We have people like the, um, the black, black women led work like the We the People of Detroit that's pointing the way. We know we can have food for all. We have a black woman that led effort by, called Soul Fire Farm led by Leah Penniman. We know we can have energy for all in a world where the sun rises every day, the wind blows every day. And folks like here on the continent, um, Ever Joyce Wynn, running a group called Shine that provides renewable energy to all. We know we can have safe, healthy, and sustainable housing for all with people like People United for Sustainable um, Housing and Rawa Gramat Zion. And we know finally that we can have livelihoods for all um, and the groups like Crenshaw Rising where communities are taking back their land and taking um, back e um, economic development. And again, we can all enjoy a vision that is that's more than just barely surviving, but actually thriving in abundance for all, following the feminist Green New Deal principles and practices. Thank you so much. A huge thank you to my fellow panelists for sharing your wisdom and words over this time together. I'll close with saying that as you have heard here, the harms, obstruction, and systemic violence perpetuated by the US government within the US and around the world will continue to be called out by civil society, will continue to be challenged by any and all who are committed to racial justice, gender justice, economic justice, global justice, and climate justice. We will continue to raise the key demands of civil society here and at home, and uplift human rights-based frameworks that demand pressure be made to release al al Fatah, all political prisoners here and in the US, persecuted and incarcerated for defending human rights, the land, and all people. We have a different vision, and we will make it known. Thank you all for being here.